I now give the floor to His Excellency Ali Savri, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Sri Lanka. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to represent Sri Lanka at the 77th session of the UNGA, a session which after two years brings together world leaders post-pandemic to an assembly in person. Permit me the honor of congratulating His Excellency Saba Korosi on being elected president of the current session. Mr. President, Sri Lanka looks forward to working closely with you and your team in the years ahead. May I also convey our appreciation to His Excellency Abdullah Sahid of the Maldives for His Excellence stewardship on the 76th session. As a close friend and neighbor of Maldives, we, exp we express particular appreciation for his presidency of hope that ga gave us renewed optimism and vigor. Building on this, we, we move to the vision of our new PGA of finding solution through solidarity, sustainability, and science. Mr. President, 77 years ago, when the battlefield of the Second World War was silent, but it horrors reverberated around the globe, a new world order emerged out of the remains of the old one. And that new world order was manifested by the Charter of the United Nations, developed by 50 nations at the San Francisco Conference. The United Nations is a table where every state can sit down, a forum where everyone can be heard and where everyone is equally important. This is the concept of multilateralism. And, that is, and this is a fundamental political principle of diplomacy. It is said that multilateral diplomacy is similar to gardening. You plant, you wait, you sow the seeds, you wait, you trim, and you harvest at some point. In multilateralism, we talk to each other. We develop a relationship of trust and confidence. And if something was to come up, you have a base to work with. Excellencies, the world is facing a multiplicity of complex interlocking, interlocking challenges. The far-reaching effects of the pandemic have been further exacerbated by the current global crisis. These vulnerabilities have been aggravated by the devastating consequences of what the Secretary General has referred to as five-alarm global fire which has resulted in Teralia in the triple planetary crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and rising pollution. We are, in addition, witnessing extreme weather patterns resulting in loss of life, property, and habitat, involuntary human displacement, and an accompanying food and energy crisis. Mr. President, it is not difficult to imagine that these trends lead to depending inequalities both within and between states. Developing countries and their economies are at extreme risk with the government facing debt default and financial collapse due to the lack of access to adequate capital while people face rising poverty, unemployment, and hunger. As a consequence, nutrition levels, especially among the children, are being affected and their education and intellectual advancement disrupted. Despite our best efforts, our collective ability to realize the sustainable development goals or even to sustain the gains already achieved is becoming increasingly difficult. Mr. President, it is against this challenging global backdrop. The significant changes have taken place in Sri Lanka since the last UNGA. The external and internal challenges we face provide an opportunity for implementing political, social, and economic reform that will lead to recovery and prosperity for our people. 
Sri Lanka believes that this is the moment to realize our collective vision for the future, an opportunity to build a more just, sustainable, and prosperous future for all Sri Lankans, to build back better. We look forward to the cooperation and support of the international community, including the United Nations, as we embark on this journey. Following prolonged social unrest and protests in the country, President Ranil Vikramasinghe, in his maiden speech in Parliament last month, stated, I quote, I will implement social and political reforms requested by the nation, unquote. These measures include a review of the present procedures, the strengthening of the institutional framework of democratic governance, and adoption of urgent measures to restore long-term economic stability. We have understood that this will only be possible if we engage in a strict adherence to fiscal discipline and far-reaching economic and institutional reforms. Mr. President, we are committed to that process. It is envisaged that through the proposed legislative and constitutional amendment, democratic governance will be reinforced with independent oversight institutions as well as with enhanced public scrutiny. Legal and administrative frameworks are being strengthened to ensure transparency, integrity, accountability, and inclusivity in providing access to justice. A greater participation of women and youth will be ensured in this process. Mr. President, we remain cognizant of and acutely sensitive to the events that have taken place in the recent past. The government is extremely sensitive to the socio-economic hardship faced by our people. We are pleased to have reached a staff level understanding with the IMF. We have put in place measures to protect the vulnerable segment of society and will endeavor to ensure that these economic reforms will have a minimum impact on their lives. Our institutions and society have demonstrated remarkable resilience in the face of very difficult circumstances. We unconditionally recognize the fact that one has the fundamental right to freedom of expression, which we all treat as sacrosanct. However, we also be appreciated that this freedom must be within the constitutional order and must be exercised having regard to one's fundamental duty to express oneself within the confines of the law. Mr. President, I am pleased to inform this August Assembly that Sri Lanka's nationwide strategy in containing the human health impact of the COVID-19 has been largely successful as a result of proactive and non-discriminatory measures by the government and the effective delivery capabilities of our strong healthcare infrastructure. Our vaccination drive exceeded WHO targets. However, as a developing country, we were highly vulnerable to the economic fallout of the pandemic. The virus has opened the window to the future, which we must exploit, highlighting the importance of multilateral cooperation through global health networks. Mr. President, permit me to briefly turn to the aspect of climate change. As a climate vulnerable country, climate change has had the potential to adversely impact the Sri Lanka's socio-economic progress as well as the food security and livelihoods. Sri Lanka has pledged to meet the targets of Paris Agreement and our updated national determined contribution submitted to the UNFCCs last year with the aim of reducing emissions to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. We firmly believe that these commitments should not adversely impact the green economic development objectives. We also ap appreciate that meeting NDC targets and executing the corresponding energy transition towards renewable and sustainable energy and energy efficiency measures will require significant climate financing. Mr. President, you will appreciate that we cannot do this alone. We believe that in tandem with our own efforts, 
the world's largest emitters of greenhouse gases, must fulfill their commitments and assist developing nations in adaptation and mitigation of measures under a common but differentiated framework. We need to work towards a just, sustainable, resilient and inclusive recovery from the adverse impact of climate change and the energy transition. Turn into the ocean, Mr. President, you will appreciate that as an island nation, we are acutely concerned about and sensitive to the impact of pollution and climate change on the oceans. With rapid pressures, pressure on land resources, the world is turning towards the ocean for sustenance, not only for food security, but also as a source of raw material for industry and energy. We are committed to the sustainable use of the ocean and its resources in consonance with SDG 14. At the UNGA May in this year, we were pleased to have led a small but significant nature-based solution to mitigate the impact of climate change that led to the UN declaring 1st March as World Seagrass Day. Seagrasses are an important carbon sink and absorb significantly more carbon than the tropical rainforest. Mr. President, there is a likelihood that the world will not reach the scheduled milestone to achieve zero hunger by 2030. It is predicted that food and nutrition security will be at great risk. Sri Lanka is paying serious heed to these warning signs. Sri Lanka supports sustainable transformation of agriculture to a modernized sector and encourages en enhanced food production to ensure food security. Sri Lanka has initiated na national food security program with the dual objective of ensuring that no citizen should suffer for the want of food and no child should be a victim of malnutrition. Adequate nutrition is a sine qua non and, a vit and vital to ensure that children of all socioeconomic backgrounds can enjoy good health. The provision of the quality education and health care for all is at the core of Sri Lanka's social protection policies and provided the foundation upon which Sri Lanka was able to mitigate the effects of global learning crisis during the COVID-19 pandemic. Rapid conversions to digital system of delivery of education threatened universal access. Participation and survival in the education system especially in the children of low-income households. Sri Lanka aims to bridge the digital divide and ensure that no child will be left behind. Mr. President, despite severe challenges, we will endeavor to maintain the significant progress we have made towards achieving 2030 Agenda on Sustainable Development. Our efforts have placed us in a leading position in the Asia-Pacific region for STG data availability, thus enhancing Sri Lanka's capacity for evidence-informed policymaking for SDGs in future. We recognize that investment in human capital is an indispensable essential for the future of our country. It is no surprise, Mr. President, Sri Lanka is ranked in the high human development category occupying rank 73 out of 191 countries globally and is the highest in the region. Having said that, we are nonetheless concerned that the current challenges have disrupted progress. The UN Secretary General has in a seri serious warning made reference to rescuing the sustainable development goals. This warning is followed by an observation by the UNDP that for the first time in 32 years, the Human Development Index has declined globally for two years consecutively. Mr. President, let me say a word about global security. Geopolitical tension among nations have heightened, creating insecurity and polarization among states. Agreed framework for arms control, non-proliferation and disarmament have become fragile. At the 10th review conference of the NPT concluded recently, which, we remain, which remains the centerpiece of global nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation regime, we were regrettably unable to arrive once again 
at a consensus outcome. While we address contemporary challenges, Mr. President, we must not forget the lingering issue of Palestine. While restating Sri Lanka's consistent and principled position that Palestinian people have a legitimate and inalienable right to the natural resources in their territory and to statehood, we further recognize the legitimate security concerns of both Palestinian and Israeli people and an urgent resolution of the matter on the basis of UN resolution on the attainment of two-state solution need to be pursued immediately. Mr. President, the absence of a regulatory supervisory regime concerning the use of new technologies in cyberspace and in artificial intelligence need to be addressed urgently. The ability to cause large-scale disruption, disinformation, and undermine, undermine the scientifically established finding is of a real concern, a danger we all face. Sri Lanka, which is implementing the nation's first information and cybersecurity strategy, has identified the importance of establishing a partnership-based approach to protect cyberspace in order to confront multinational cyber threats. Mr. President, I must make a brief reference to the scourge of terrorism. Sri Lanka was a victim of terrorism for several decades. Terrorist choice of targets, methods of financing and radicalization, as well as the use of new technologies as weapons has been constantly evolving. Legislative measures and law enforcement mechanism must be put in place to counter radical ideologies leading to violent extremism and to curb the terrorist use and abuse the internet and social media platforms. At the same time, it is necessary to develop the critical thinking capacity of youth, strengthen, strengthen community bonds, foster a sense of civic responsibility, and build community resilience to mitigate the effects and influences of violence extremist ideology leading to terrorism. Mr. President, as our contribution to maintaining international peace and security, Sri Lanka looks forward to enhancing our participation in US, UN peacekeeping operation with professional men and women to serve as UN peacekeepers. I take this opportunity to honor the thousands of men and women who for decades have helped countries navigate the difficult path from conflict to peace under, blue, under the blue helmet. We have taken many measures to ensure that Sri Lankan peacekeepers with a wealth of experience in counter-terrorism and counter-insurgency operation are trained and equipped with theoretical and practical knowledge of all necessary functions of peacekeeping, including the promotion and protection of human rights. Mr. President, it is indeed a watershed moment for the international community, a moment of great challenge and opportunity, a complex and interconnected crisis that we face cannot be resolved by nations acting on their own. It is an opportunity to demonstrate global solidarity, diplomacy and collective efforts, leveraging the ideas and talents of all our people and all segments of our society to find transformative solutions which leave no one behind. Multilateralism, Mr. President, is a tool for diplomacy that rises above such challenges. Conflicts, disasters, and crises will not stop at passport control. Multilateralism is not without its shortcomings, and undoubtedly, it provides a solid framework for resolving contemporary challenges. Mr. President, this is, this I would say, is the mission of this August Assembly. And perhaps the singular reason for which it was established 77 years ago, and that perhaps is the reason why Sri Lanka and many others applied to be members, to participate, to be visible, to be heard, to embellish this organization with our own flavors, perspectives, history, and knowledge to this fine 
amalgam and grow from common work discussions and dispute that we join issue with. I might wind up by citing the observation of one of our late prime ministers who committed Sri Lanka to the way of socialist democracy, to non-alignment and to independent foreign policy based on friendship with all countries, irrespective of differing, differing ideological and social system, when he said, I quote, we have to build up a new society for ourselves, one, as I have said, which best suits the genius of our country. We should like to get some ideas and principles from this side and some from the other until a coherent form of society is made up that suits our people in the context of a changing world today. That is why we do not range ourselves on the side of this power block or that. Mr. President, permit me to make an observation that the 193 nations represented here jointly share the responsibility to establish justice, to maintain peace, and ensure progress in a world that is in trouble as never before. We have a charter and a formidable body of international law, inclusive of our supreme law, the Constitution of the Republic, and other local statutes. We are acutely conscious of the fact that notwithstanding all these sophistications, multi-pronged challenges remain. The government of Sri Lanka is committed to overcome these challenges. It is to that commitment that Sri Lanka pledges today in the sincere hope that we will exploit the crisis that is at hand, build back better, leaving no one behind and rise to new horizons of freedom and progress. I thank you. I thank the Minister for Foreign Affairs of Sri Lanka.